before we get started, make sure I pull it up, baby. What's going on, guys? Chewie's gonna be on this. A little ramble today. What's up, guys? So um, let me go ahead and get everything pulled up, and we'll get started today. It's funny every time I. Uh, <laughs> Every time I, I do one of these, I, we always seem to do it at the same time as Joe Rogan's doing a podcast. Joe Rogan is? Yeah. But then, what, what's but, his podcast on? But then again, he's he's doing one all the time. He does a podcast um, like 12 a day. He, he knocks out a few. When you guys jump in, man, um, let us know where you're coming from and um, say what's up. And uh, we'll see if we can get this. Let me, uh, let me make an adjustment real quick so I'm not talking in front of the microphone. Yeah. Get that... Uh, Come on over. Get closer and get comfortable, Chewy. Oh, you're just moving the angle, huh? Very smart. You're so smart, dude. Oh, let me unplug that. Uh, what's up, guys? Charlotte, North Carolina. A lot of people saying things. What's up, guys? So at. Are you on here yet? Is that going to be it? Yeah, let's see. Let's All right, that'll work. Yeah. Let's lower that guy down a little bit and angle him. Yeah, well. Pink, pink. Sorry, I'm being aggressive with your mic. I didn't know if you were talking about the mic or the, the camera. So what's up, guys? So, <laughs> um, again, when you guys jump in, let us know where you're coming from. Yeah. And uh, just say what's up. Uh, good to have you guys out there. So many of you guys today joining in real quickly. So... Um, I wanted to uh, go ahead and do a ramble with you guys first, and then afterwards we'll do some Q and A. Won't be yeah. too, won't be too too long. Um, prep and no prep Spears. Thanks for the buck, brother. Appreciate that. Um, so the other day I got a question, and I get these questions pretty often, where people will often sort of send me a message about, and and they do it in a number of different ways, but essentially it boils down to the fact that they compare themselves to others. The most recent question that I got was from a guy named Nelson. And Nelson, he's 33 years old, and he started jujitsu just like, you know, a lot of guys do in their 30s. Like, he was a retired military guy, and he's getting into it, and he's excited about this new thing that he's doing. And one second. What happened there? I don't know. It was weird. Sorry, guys. Uh, we're going to start are you, over. Are you locked up? No, I'm good. Okay, well, I'm just going to keep going then because it says I don't know. It says I'm fine. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. I love that picture. That's incredible. But Nelson, he's 33 years old. Um, I don't know why this one's not working. So I don't. I've got you. Will you pull it up and see? Yeah, I mean. Sorry, guys. We're experiencing some technical difficulties. It's been a day of technical difficulties. Yeah. I'm working on it, but I, I think our router connection's a little funky today. Go with uh oh, is that the Wi-Fi? Yeah, sorry guys, but we're just gonna see if we're connected before I keep going because I don't keep talking. If you guys, you are connected because okay. I've got you on my phone. All right. <laughs> um, don't worry, the the smoother version will be out on iTunes tomorrow. That's right. Um, but we got a question from Nelson. And so basically what's going on is Nelson is he's getting into jujitsu and he, you know, he's comparing himself to the younger guys in the gym, right? Because the younger guys in the gym, he says, when he started off, they're just surpassing him a lot faster. And he says that a lot of times him and some of the, maybe the older guys are kind of having this situation where they're questioning themselves, right? He says that, you know, he doesn't have any intention of quitting, but at the same time, he's kind of wondering to himself, right? Is it worth it? And so this idea of measuring yourself to others is something that it's it's human nature. We all do it, right? We all sort of measure our progress based upon others. It's, it's kind of how we know where we stand. Um, and that's okay. It's okay to use it as a measuring stick. But at the same time, you don't want to compare your own experience to someone else's, right? Because your own unique experience is your own. Um, and I was thinking about my own jiu-jitsu, right? Because again, my experiences are the things that I can give you guys. I can't tell you, and I never want to come from a place of like, I, I've got it all figured out because I don't. I, I hope that I come across more of as a person who is kind of figuring things out and then sharing things with you guys. But I think about my own experience, 
right? Like when I first started, and this is this kind of goes out to more of the older guys in the uh, in jiu-jitsu, but obviously for those of you that are, you know, maybe not as old as, th- as 30 or whatever, it, it, you can kind of take the lesson from it. But I think about when I first started jiu-jitsu. I was willing to sacrifice everything, right? Like I sacrificed clothing. I didn't buy new clothes. I had, I remember I had jiu-jitsu shirts all the time. That's all I wore. And then in the winter I would wear jeans and in the summer I'd wear cargo shorts. I sacrificed the way that I lived because I remember like when I was in school, I didn't have a lot of money. And so me and a buddy of mine, we shared an, a studio apartment. I would sleep on the air mattress. He would sleep on a futon, right? And like, again, I was a young guy in college. Good, good luck trying to bring your girl home to that. And then I sacrificed you know, jobs that would have paid more money because the schedule sucked. And I'm like, I'm not sacrificing this. I sacrificed so many things. And I brung that up to him because I was like, man, like you, you're 30 years old. I think, I think he has kids. Um, and you know, you might have a wife or girlfriend. You're probably not going to want to sacrifice all these things now in your thirties that I I was willing to sacrifice that most 20 year olds in in their younger days, they're willing to sacrifice more, but you don't want to judge your experience because again, they're, they don't have the responsibility. They don't have the things that you have and they're willing to, to give up all these things for this one thing that they have. And also for you guys that are a little bit older, if you're judging yourself to the younger crowd, Remember that, again, they are in a, a newer model vehicle doing this this whole journey. And so, again, it's just it's not apples and apples. It's different. And But the biggest thing, though, I think about is the way that I've come to, to be here, right? Like, if I was to judge my experience based upon just being competitive in the gym or in competitions, which is what's happening with Nelson, he's comparing his his ability to be effective on the mat, his ability to compete, these sorts of things, compared to the younger guys – if I was judging myself on being just the best competitor, right, that I could be, uh, or being the best competitor in the world, then I would be in a bad spot because I'm not the best competitor in the world. But I've had my own unique experiences, right? And every one of us has unique experiences that wait for us, right? Like I think about the fact that because of where I've gone, I've been able to compete pretty well, but I've also been able to, um, you know, build myself up from a young kid who was unconfident and, you know, the grappling changed me into a confident man, right? It gave me a lot of, like a lot of lessons that I learned. It exposed me to a lot of people that I would have not met otherwise. And, you know, in my own sort of like jujitsu career, it's given me the chance to impact people in a positive way every single day. Hundreds of people, you know, come into the gym and I'm able to make some sort of positive impact on them in, in person. And then, you know, if I would have been focused solely on how good I am in competitions and that'd be the only thing Then I would have missed out on the things that I do with you guys. Like you guys watching right now, you guys watching me right now has little to do with my ability to compete, right? I can compete and you guys know this, but it has little to do with that, right? It has to do with the things that I'm sharing with you. And again, if I would have been so focused on the fact that I wasn't the best competitor, which again is kind of what Nelson's hang up is or judging my experience based upon someone else's experience, then I would have missed this opportunity to be able to share with you guys and be able to impact so many of you guys. Like recently I've gotten um, in person, I've talked to different people that have you know met me and they're like, dude, you're like, you're like my second coach. You're like my online coach that I, I feel like I've talked to for years now. And then I meet them in person and I realize the impact that I've had. And so I would have missed out on that unique opportunity if I would have been focused on solely on whether or not I was the you know world champion or whatever it might be or whether I was doing as good as some of the other people. And so, again, we are going to measure ourselves. We're going to judge ourselves upon how we do against other people. This is just a given, right? It's human nature to sort of understand where we sort of stand in, in the in the pecking order, right? That's normal. It's going to happen. And you can use the people around you that are really good, that maybe they're better than you or maybe they're climbing faster than you. Use them to help push you, right, to motivate you, to like want to get up and, and push yourself harder. But ultimately, be okay with where you're at personally. Be okay with your own experience because it's yours. It's your experience, not someone else's. Mm -hmm. And again, everybody else is going to have their own experience and you have your own unique one waiting for you and be okay with that because it's yours, right? It's not someone else's, but that's okay. Um, And I share this because a lot of times, you know, people, they see someone else having their experience and then they want that and they want it to look like that. And then when they get in and they have their own, it maybe doesn't look so pretty as theirs. It doesn't look as nice as theirs. It's not as cool as theirs. And they get bummed out about that, right? And that's, but it's okay because that's theirs. And this is yours. And so for for Nelson, right, man, like, again, let that go. You have your own unique experience to be, to be had. So focus on that rather than focus on, you know, being the world beater, being the young guy. Again, you can still compete because there's master's divisions, there's belt levels, there's all this stuff. 
but let go, especially, you know, getting into jujitsu at like in your thirties, don't worry about being a, a 22 year old black belt. That's not on the table anymore. Instead, focus on the experiences that you can have, you know, because again, in, in, I say this, even if you guys don't get into competitions, there's guys that are amazing coaches. You know, John Donaher is not the only really, I mean, he's a really amazing coach. But I've met plenty of really good coaches that weren't competitors, and they're really good. I remember learning lots of stuff from them. And again, there's plenty of those guys out there. And so you don't have to compete all the time just to be good at jiu-jitsu. You can be good without competing, right? Um, and be willing to go your own way and have your own experience. And sort of, again, there's a quote from Walden. I love the quote, but it's it's something to the effect of, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase a bit here, but it says, you know, when when you... It's like when you're marching and you hear music, right? Follow the music that you hear and, and follow it wherever it's going to go. I, I'm, I'm butchering the quote. I'm actually going to pull it up because otherwise it's going to it's going to irritate me because um, I actually love the quote a lot. I've used it in a, a couple of the videos. Um, Walden. Mm-hmm. Here it is. I love this quote. This is a beautiful quote. Um, this is from Walden. Uh, this, that's Thoreau's book. Um, it's The quote is, if a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it's because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music which he hears, however measured or far away. So again, I love that. I use it all the time. Uh, obviously, I don't use it that often because I forget the damn thing. Uh, but I love that quote because, again, there's different paths. And a lot of times we get sucked into the competitive competition jujitsu training our balls off right all the time bah, 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 right all the time but that that's not the only path you can have right there's plenty of different ways you can go um and so i share that with you guys and, and when you when you start to feel a tugging uh, you know going a certain way maybe this means that you're going to start playing with leg locks and your gym doesn't like leg locks maybe it means that you're going to back off from competitions um even though everybody else in your gym's competing whatever it is be willing to sort of follow your intuition, see where it goes, and, and embrace the experience that's waiting for you. Um, so we'll end it with that. So Nelson, brother, um, hope that's helpful to you when you watch the video. But again, be willing to kind of go your own way, man, and don't worry about those younger guys where they're going. They have their own experiences. And again, you have things that you have waiting for you, but you got to be willing to see them through. Um, so guys, real quick, so now that you guys are on, the ramble is over. So let's do some Q&A. I wanted to sort of jump in with you guys to do a little bit of Q&A today. Uh, we haven't done one of these in a bit. Um, so we'll start looking through the comments uh, down below. But if you guys have a question, throw it down in the comments below. And uh, Eugene and I will pick some of the fun ones out, and we'll, uh, we'll roll with them. Chewy, while we're looking, if somebody is, um, here's a question okay. on that, because uh, I've had some discussions with some guys at the gym, mm -hmm. you know, how do you motivate someone or how do you have them motivate themselves, like just to look within themselves and not be keeping their eyes on other areas and other people? Motivate like, is, them in like, what? Like just to keep going, keep pushing, you know, keep training hard. If they're like, if they feel like they're falling behind or lacking progress, is there anything you feel like would be beneficial for them to... Like a mindset thing or a... You know, this is something like this whole idea of falling behind. What is this fall... Like, what is falling behind, right? Like, you're, you're, you're never falling behind. You're right where you're supposed to be. It's right. right where you are, right? right? And people are in your gym are going to jump. You, sometimes it's going to be you that's doing the jump skill-wise, and sometimes it's going to be someone else. Right. And you've got to be willing to be okay with that. I made a post today talking about iron sharpens iron, right? So the idea of that meaning that one... Like, because it comes from a... a, a in Proverbs, in the Bible, and it said, um, you know, just like iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another, right? So the idea is that I can't do it alone. I have to have team a team with me. Um, and it also implies that the only way that you can make me better is if you're made of the tough stuff that I'm made of, right? Because if you're not tough enough to push me and to stress me out, then you're not going to make me any better, right? It's like trying to sharpen iron with copper. You can't do it. It's too soft. So you got to be made of tough stuff. And it's also to understand that, like, again, there's a, a grinding down process, right? So if we're sharpening by grinding down, this is a breakdown, which allows for the sharpness that we need, right? So there's always a, in, in everything, it's a natural flow. There's a breakdown before there's a buildup. And so you got to be willing to go with that. The thing is, is that I tell people this all the time because I honestly, I would experience frustration. I would experience, like, desire to want to improve, but I never... I never felt like I was falling behind and I never really cared. The only thing that I was worried about doing was getting in there because again, I you know, when I was in high school wrestling, I I was a fat kid 
and I got into it. I sucked. I, and by the way, I've never really been good at anything. Like I've, I, I'm not, I don't consider myself a particularly talented person at anything. Um, I'm kind of a bonehead, but I'm willing to just basically grind. That's the, if you wanted to say like the, the most valuable trait I have is I can grind. I just don't care. Right. I'm a, I grew up as a poor kid, didn't have a lot. So I'm willing to just, just put my nose to the grinder and keep going. Mm. And so I learned in wrestling that if, you know, I just keep going, I get better. It's, it's that it's persistence mm. overall else. And so for anyone that's like, you know, getting upset about falling behind, you're missing the point. Right, like that's silly. I could understand fall like like just getting out of a schedule. That stuff happens. Life happens. You kind of get out of your routine. That happens all the time. Sure, no problem. I could understand, you know, just things getting in the way. Totally understand that. But to quit jujitsu or to get but or to get demotivated because you got beat or because someone's doing better than you or because you know whatever that's silliness to me. Because I remember what would happen. My reaction when I was training when someone would beat me man, I got fired up, right? Because I was like, oh, he beat me today. So like, that means he just, he, he broke my game down. I got to figure him out. Right. right? So right. I would like, what I would do, especially a lot of times I would go in there and I would, I would want to roll with the guy every time Yeah. because I'm like, I got to figure you out because I know that if I figure you out, if I roll with you more, eventually I'm going to figure you out. And, um, you know, so I would never look at that as a negative thing. So if someone beats you in your gym, pray, be, be grateful for that. Because again, that's the iron sharpening the iron, right? Awesome. Um, and so I would say, you know, if you're being demotivated by that, that's silly, right? It just it's it's a it's a silly thing, and you're 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 missing the whole point. You should be excited to be in the gym because you're around cool people. You're learning something really cool. The exercise component is nice. Um, you're you're developing this skill. And this being a part of this community, just embrace all that and just be persistent. And again, motivation comes and goes. Just be disciplined to keep going, even on those days where maybe you don't feel like going. Because a lot of times, those days where you don't feel like going, you'll come out and you'll be like, man, that was a good training session. I'm glad I went. So. Yeah, they're the most beneficial a lot of times just because you have to work a lot harder maybe to you know to be there and to work, you know, to, to actually put that effort in because mm -hmm. you're just not as... Uh, you know, you don't feel as great. So. Well, right. But also yeah. the, the physiological effects of it on the brain and the body yeah, are huge. So sure. a, after you're done exercising, your the muscle spindles in your body begin to relax, which then triggers the brain. Hey, the muscles are relaxed. We can relax. Um, and then you also get this big friggin' dump of dopamine and, and, and norepinephrine, yeah. do, uh, endorphins, all this stuff gets serotonin just yeah. pumping through your brain and your body. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, for me, it's almost like, it, it literally is like a drug because what'll happen is, is if I feel like I'm in a funk, right? Like so anytime I do like lots of like work on the computer or whatever, when I sit down and, I, and I'm in a funk, I I know what I need to do. I get up and go for a workout. I'll go to the gym and lift. I'll go to the gym and do jujitsu. I'll go for a long, like hour long walk just to get some movement going. I'll do some yoga, something. But that movement is like, it's like a drug. And it's literally one of those things where I've just conditioned myself that anytime I feel funky, I feel kind of off, I feel bleh, I go move. And it's amazing because it works. Yeah. You know, like they've even done studies where they use exercise to help treat depression. Sure. Right. And they've done studies where a lot of times to like exercise will be on par with antidepressants for depression. Yeah. Right. It, when, when done consistently over long periods of time. So anyway. Probably better. But yeah, so I'm going to quit asking you questions because you go for like an hour when I ask you. That's what I do, man. All right. So here's one. Carlos G. Mm. What DVDs do you recommend for BJJ? I don't recommend any DVDs because I don't own a DVD player. Okay. Videos, <laughs> Chewy. Uh, man, it's funny. Isn't that funny? We say DVDs and but like, I, you know, we say like, hey, I've got a DVD coming out or whatever, but we don't yeah. ever, no one actually, I don't know anyone that has a DVD player. You watch DVDs. Most people use it on their phone. Yeah. Um, which one? Yeah. I, I don't know, man. It depends. Like, I have some. <laughs> Shameless plug, right? Yeah. Well, um, I mean, it depends on what you want to do, right? right that's that's right. that's the way that I think about it. It really comes down to where do you want to move? You know, so for me, like, for instance, when I, when I first got into jiu-jitsu, I wanted to get really good at um, side control because I was taking people down getting into side control. So I watched the side control series on this, uh, on this DVD that I bought. It was an actual DVD. Um, but now... You know, sometimes I'll buy video streaming series for a particular facet of the game that I want to take in for my game. And so if there's a way that I want to go, I'll take some information in. It's the same thing for you guys. You know, don't 
don't get so hung up on whatever. Think about where do you want your game to move? Because you get to decide, right? You get to decide through the drilling and all the other stuff that you do and, and the moves that you try in the class. So if you, when you're trying to decide a, a program or a series to buy, find one that sort of fits where you want to move to. Um, you know, I always encourage, encourage fundamentals over, you know, over all else. Um, and it's like, that's one of the reasons why a lot of times I, I sort of promote my grip fighting series, just because I think grip fighting is really important. Um, I see a lot of guys that get really frustrated with their, their training in the gi and it's cause they don't fight grips. Yeah. Um, and so if you're a gi fighter, that's really useful, but again, just go out and look out, uh, different ones that you, uh, that you might like that sort of go with the game that you would like to develop and just get that one. Um, investing in yourself in those ways. Like I don't spend money on a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. As you know, I'm pretty like, I'm kind of frugal, but the one thing I've always invested money in is like information, yeah. whether it be books, sure. audio books, um, programs for business or jujitsu, anything. I'll just, I'll go out and buy it because that stuff that, that gives, it makes me better. And Material possessions, they can go away, but yeah. I, I get to keep it. It's mine. It's me. I'm building myself up. You can't take that away. That's mine. Show you real quick. Uh, Josh Jordan asks, what gym is your seminar at on April 5th? On April 5th, we're going to be in Gracie, Gracie Bradenton. Um, it's, um, I think it's a part of, uh, it's a guy named Sonny. Uh, I'm friends with him. It's, it's in uh, just south of uh, Tampa. And so for you guys that if you're in the Florida area, basically it's south of Tampa, it's Gracie Bradenton. Uh, we're going to be doing April 5th and 6th. So on April the 5th, it's going to be a Q&A, kind of like a chewy ramble mixed with a little bit of live training, chance for you guys to ask questions, a chance for us to kind of hang out. On Saturday, we're going to be doing an actual seminar. We're going to be going through gi and no gi techniques, so bring both. Um, basically, I'm going to show you some some techniques in the no gi and gi, and show you how the grips change. And then what we'll do is we'll we'll give a little bit of time, go clean up, and then we're going to meet up at a restaurant um, and have a like sort of a dinner together for those that um, are interested. And so that's kind of the, the idea. This way, we can have some drinks and food together and kind of hang out. Yeah, so. give Chewy one drink and then see him ramble on some stuff, and then Man. post on social media. It gets, like it, uh, it gets wild. Is it about the farmers, Chewy? It's about. It's always about the damn yeah, farmers. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that question right there? Which one? Highlighted. I'm I, I can't. Right, look right in front of you. Oh. We're technologically advanced. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Ray Delgado, have you ever had instructors um, that make fun of you because you're not good? Man, I've had... I make fun of my students, and they make fun of me. Yes. When I was a student, they made fun of me all the time, and it was not because I wasn't good. It was because, <laughs> typically speaking, when you're in a, a a group, especially predominantly men, one of the ways that you typically know that you're in is they mess with you, right? Like that's how you kind of know you're in. Like I give Eugene so much shit, and and he'll give it back to me, and we give each other like, um, you know, all kinds of all kinds of stuff, yeah. and it's usually because again that we uh, we we care for each other. Typically, yeah. if I don't like you, I don't really say anything funny about you. So what I would say is, man, I think honestly, if he's messing with you, especially in the presence of others, and it's not weird, it's probably a good thing. It probably means that he's like just messing with you. If you if you suspect that there's a problem, ask him. But more than likely, I bet it's not. Like I remember there was one guy years ago. Um, this is no joke. It was one of the guys. I was a brown belt at the time. I wasn't teaching full time, but I was teaching the fundamentals class. And I, I, I just sort of said a joke with the guy. I was messing with him. And later on that day, we were rolling. And when we were rolling, I could feel that there was a different like intensity going on with him. It was strange, right? And after the roll was over, I asked him. I said, "Man, is everything okay?" Like I just, I got this intuitive sense that something was wrong. He got up and he pushed me. Right. And he called me a bitch. He's like, bitch, he pushed me. I was like, whoa, 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 what's going on? And he like talked to me. He said, you know, remember what you said earlier? And I looked at him. I was like, dude, I was totally joking. Like, that's how, like, again, I come from a wrestling background and football and all that other stuff. That's how we show, like, almost like our, uh, our brotherly affection towards one another. We kind of rag on each other a little bit in a fun way. And he go and he then afterwards he looked at me. He goes, dude, I'm so sorry. He's like, thanks for not whooping my ass. Um, but like, no, he was, you know, it was just a joke. And so, you know, typically if you, if you were to come to my gym, all the guys, we're all just messing with each other all the time. I and mean, that's just how we show that we we kind of like each other. So. Yeah, and, and Ray, I saw in the comments you posted that you won gold in like your first competition. So it's probably because they're just messing with you. He won a gold? Uh, yeah. So Bro, you, like gold. Here, here's, a, here's, one, here's a fun one. You just won gold. Like your coach ain't, he's not making fun of you because you're not good. You you, <laughs> you don't win a gold medal and say, oh, he's guess the guy sucks. We have one of my guys, he's a, uh, he's a white belt and he like on a whim, 
he went out and did the the like the Master Worlds and like he had you know oh, yeah he, he won his he won his uh, he won his match. He's an older guy, right? He won his match and he became a world champion. White oh, belt. Oh, so much shit for that. I don't call him by his name. I call him World Champ. I was like the World Champ is here. Right. We're, Every we're, time somebody rolls with him, we say that shit. To like, that, like when he came down to team training this weekend, I was like, "Uh oh, the world champ is here. Um, and I don't do yeah, it because awesome. I don't I, I absolutely love the guy. So he's a fun guy to have around. So it was just it was just great fun. So, yeah, there's that comment right there. So which one right there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Said, one gold my first match or my first competition. Yeah, you, you won gold. Man. He's just messing with you. It's good. That, that's one thing, man. Guys, like I, I've gotten some questions like that, like. Most coaches, if they say something to you, typically there's no malice out of it. And if you ever suspect that there is, definitely talk to your coach and open the communication to check with them because they'll probably tell you, oh, no, no, no. A lot of times we, you know, it, have, I don't know if you guys have ever had this happen before. I guarantee you probably have. Have you ever had a situation where someone said something to you in a weird way, like, you know, outside of jiu-jitsu, and then the rest of the day it was just like stuck in your head. You're like, what did he mean? You know, or, you know, maybe you said something to someone and then you're like, man, I hope he didn't take it the wrong way. Right. 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 And then you talk to him later and you're like, no, no, it's, it's fine, dude. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, it's that same thing where... Again, we get in our own heads a little bit too much. We delve, you know, just delve on it too much. You know, the thing is, most people's favorite subject is themselves, not other people. So typically, they're not really giving you too. They don't really care too much. Yeah, so. I've had that before too. And you just like, I, I was like, man, that didn't sound right. Or yeah, you know, you yeah. like because they're like people you care about. You train with them all the time. They're, you know, there's no reason that you you take it in perspective too. Like if there's no reason for them to be mean to you, they probably aren't being mean. Yeah. they're just jerks. Yeah, so. Um, you want to read that? Is your vision all right, Chewie? Yeah, it's good. <laughs> Mr. Well, I, 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 sh shut up. My vision's fine. <laughs> Mr. T. Smith. 2020. Mr. T. Smith writes, what's another way to push yourself harder on the mats to develop your game beyond just regular rolling? I've been rolling with my eyes closed lately, and it's been going, it's been great. What other ways do you like? I don't like rolling my eyes closed. I'd be, I'd be afraid. Something's gonna like come down and hit me, and I won't, I won't see it coming. I um, check your oil is what we're gonna do. That's right. right. Oh, um, so it, push yourself. So I think you, there's a lot of different parameters that you can play with when you're talking about jujitsu training. I mean, obviously you could put your push yourself in the the weight room and, and with cardio and stuff like that. But if you're talking about with rolling, I think one of the coolest things you can do is you can one, you can shorten the rounds down. So let's say, for instance, if you shorten the rounds down, then you should up the intensity, right? So for instance, if you're doing a 10 minute roll and you know you're doing 10 minutes, you're gonna pace yourself for 10 minutes. But if you've got two minutes, and you know that you've only got two minutes, you can really press yourself hard and then take a nice long break afterwards. So this way you get like, it's almost like a sprint, mm -hmm. right? So basically if you do a full sprint, you should give yourself a nice long rest in between so then you can have another explosive sprint. Um, you know, and you can also do things in between. Like last night, um, I had the guys doing this thing where basically they would hang on to a, uh, I had them holding onto the other person's lapel, suspending their weight off the ground and basically pre-exhausting their grips. And then afterwards I would get them into a position where they had to fight for the grip. And essentially I was just getting their, their grips to just burn. I was getting their hands to burn and the rounds were really short. So this way they had, there was a lot of movement. Um, you could also do some things like shark tanks um, or round robin. So you could have a guy come in, like you could get together with a couple of your buddies and say, okay, like I'm going to stay in for three rounds and I'm going to roll with each one of you guys. Like maybe there's three of them or something. And I'm going to roll with each one of you guys um, for two minutes a piece. And then we'll cycle through immediately and just keep going. Yeah. Um, and there's all kinds of different ways. But um, a lot of times I think that the idea of just even situational rolling can be really good. You could do like just takedowns. Takedowns are brutal as far as being like ex getting exhausted. Nothing will wear you out more than trying to go for takedowns. Um, but you could do lots of situational rolling. So there's lots of ways with the parameters of um, the rolling itself where you can change the situation. You can raise the intensity by shortening down the time. There's a lot of different ways to do it. I think Chewy already answered why it's addicting. Jack Thomas, get your get your butt out the gym and, and train. Get I'm, your train on. He said he said he was going to not train, hey. but then he listened to the thing that we're doing here, and yeah. he's going to go train. So Jack Thomas. Somebody thinks I'm Adam. Adam. You're Adam. Adam. This is not Adam. Adam would only say Adam. So Adam. you know it's not. That's the giveaway right there. Adam has a beautifully shaven head. Oh, man. I'm getting there soon. My head is I'm losing not, it. I've got, <laughs> I've got lots of hair. All right. So this guy that, or the person that thought I was Adam, uh, asking about judo throws. He says, how do I get my coach to teach judo throws if he never teaches them and prefers wrestling-based takedowns? There's no judo place near me. Mm, well, I mean, here's one thing. Um, why do you want to do judo throws? 
let me ask you that. Like, why do you want to do judo throws? Um, I think, t- honestly, this is just my opinion. I think a lot of times wrestling is an easy care, like it is an easier transition to jujitsu than judo. Um, I've seen a lot of guys use, obviously in the gi you can use it, but I see a lot of people that come from traditional judo backgrounds, they struggle with using those throws in jiu-jitsu, and it requires a lot of um, sort of adjusting, right? You have to adjust a lot of grips, and a lot of throws you can't use, whereas a lot of times shooting in on legs and grabbing legs, a lot of times I think it's a lot easier. Um, There are some judo throws that are really, really helpful. Um, I mean, one, you got to ask your coach, because I'm not your coach. Um, but I, w- I would I, I would ask you why do you want to learn judo throws opposed to the wrestling t- takedowns? Okay, maybe that one didn't think I was Adam. Maybe his name's Adam. Um, let's see. And so, if you guys have a question right now, Eugene's going through them to, to look through them. Um, but if you guys do have a question, feel free to throw it in there. And uh, we'll we'll get to it in just a minute. We have a few more minutes Everybody left. Everybody says a lot of nice things, by the way. We really appreciate that. Like C flat says, "Chewy, I can't say thank you enough for all you have done uh, and are doing for the BJ community. You're appreciated. appreciate it." How does that make you feel, dude? Good. You feel like, yeah. like you're doing something important. Uh, I don't know that I feel like I'm doing anything important. I'm just sharing experiences. Yeah. Right. I, I, again, it's the same thing that like I do in the gym. Like it, I don't think that people. At least I don't, you know, I don't really realize what I'm doing. Like even in the gym, like there's been times where um, I remember we had one of the guys, um, I'm actually good friends with him, um, but when he he first started training with us back in 2014, he told me, this is about two years after the fact, but he told me that when he first started training in 2014, the day before he came into the gym, he said that he was in a really bad place in his life at the time. He said he was sitting out in front of a bus stop and he was watching the bus go by and the, the, you know, that wind would basically kind of shake your face and you can kind of feel it brush across you. And he said he was watching the buses go by and he thought to himself, man, if I just step out in front of this bus, right, it'll, it'll all be over, right? He was just thinking about just dying. He didn't want to be there. He said he came into the gym and he said that between, you know, me and, and all the other people that are there, you know, doing this thing, it, it built him up. And he said, man, he goes, it gave me something to like want to do every day that like it kind of got rid of that urge to do anything like that. And uh, even now he, you know, we do some work together. And, um, you know, a lot of times he's like said certain things that I've said or done have been really helpful or impacted. And this has been the case with a lot of people inside the gym. And it's, I'm not doing it for that reason. I mean, I want to be as helpful as possible. Um, because I, you know, I want to give people the same thing that I've gotten from this stuff, but at the same time I'm doing it because it just, I don't know, there's something about it. Just, I feel like that's what I'm supposed to do. Right. And a lot of times I don't realize the impact until after the fact, when someone comes up to me and says, Hey man, by the way, this was helpful. Um, or by the way, this changed something or, you know, whatever it is. And so I'm just trying to do the things I'm trying to be as helpful as possible, but I don't really realize the impact. So that said, it's really helpful or it's really nice when you guys share that, yeah. um, you know, when something like that happens. So well, I, I always it. like I always get see people get surprised when they meet you like at a tournament or somewhere. Mm-hmm. And they're like they're I think they're generally surprised that you're like the same person all the time. Like you're not like putting on any kind of show or anything. You're just being yourself. <laughs> it's not a show. Right, right. He's <laughs> a big goofball everywhere he goes. All if, the time. You, if you guys follow my Instagram, especially like when we go on trips and stuff, oh man, it gets wild. Like this weekend yeah. we were down in uh, Nashville hanging out and uh, I had a couple of uh, bourbon, a uh, couple drinks of bourbon. Like a sip of bourbon. I had, I had like a drink. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we were so getting fun. into all kinds of random conversations and um, and I was just, I'm, I'm, I'm just the rambly, weird sort of person that I am here, so... Jess was like, God, he always, always gets in these deep conversations. I know. So she, luckily, luckily, my wife was there, and you guys were like, yeah, me, for like an hour and a half just going at yeah, it. Yeah, me and me and Eugene's wife are going at it. But my my girlfriend, right? She's a she's a sweetheart. I love her to death. But like, <laughs> she's she, the best. She, she she like she doesn't think about things on this level that I do all the time. Where I'm like getting. You know, she she she, she I, does just not like twenty four seven. Well, yeah, I mean, like I think I think about everything, and I think about the deeper meanings constantly. So mm-hmm. we'll be doing something simple, and I'll be like, you know what? I wonder why. And I'll go into this long monologue, and she'll just, you know, I can almost look at her, and she's going, oh god, here he goes. Yeah. So, but that's who I am. So if you guys ever like, that's one thing. If you guys ever see me, um, 
whether it be a tournament or whatever, because sometimes I get messages from people where they say they wanted to come say hey at a tournament or something. If you see me at a tournament or even, hell, I've met several people at airports and stuff like that, please come say hey. Again, I'm not, um, it would be more than, it would be my pleasure to meet someone, especially if I've said something or done something that's been helpful to you. I'd love to talk. So. Yeah. All right. Trent Quaresma. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Uh, brand new blue belt. I want to be incredibly technical, but you get tapped a lot by blue and white belts uh, because I'm concentrating on technical aspects. Is this the wrong approach? You know, I, this idea of technical, right? Like when people use the word, like, I want to be technical, I always assume that they mean like slow and like methodical and, you know, like detailed and all that stuff. But the reality is, is that I, to me, technique being effective with a technique encompasses not just your ability to be slow and methodical, but also your ability to be quick mm. and precise, right? So I don't know your, what you mean by trying to be technical, um, but when we're coming to execution of te technique, you use whatever you got in the tank, right? So basically, you know, uh, some techniques, they do well with a little bit of prerequisite strength or power being used. I mean, if you look at like a double leg or a, a single leg, they can be executed with beautiful technique, but they're also incorporating a lot of power and speed and precision, right? Um, so not everything's going to be slow. And again, I don't know that this is you, but I know that a lot of guys, when they use the word technique or technical, they mean like this really slow sort of way of rolling and understand that your attributes, the, whatever God gave you, as far as your strength, speed, athleticism, you know, power, whatever you have, it's going to be used into your game and it's, it should be used in your game. Use it to help you with your technical aims. Um, and if you feel like you're thinking too much and it's getting you caught, then that's where you need to back up a little bit and you need to get out of the way. Um, a lot of times people that are super analytical, they have problems with this where they, like guys that are like engineers, right? They have to think about everything, which like A to B to C to D, you know, everything mm -hmm. has to be this friggin' flow chart where you, sometimes with, with what we're doing, you just got to get out of the way. Um, I remember the, what is it? It's, um, it's, I think it's Miles Davis. It might be Charlie, Charlie Parker. I'm going to look it up real quick so I don't mess up these quotes. I've been messing them up all day. I got <laughs> Chewy quotes. Um, but it's a it's a beautiful quote. I want to say it's from Charlie Parker. Um, I'm probably going to mess it up here. I don't know. Do, do, do. Chewy's all about quotes. I, well, I just like when people yeah. say, so... Um, Basically, Charlie Parker, I can't find the quote right now, but basically what he says is like you you learn the you learn music, you play music, you you know, you learn all the rules of music, and then eventually you just say, fuck it, I'm now I'm just gonna forget all the rules and play music. So when you guys are training, your goal is that you're learning these techniques, you're learning how to use these techniques, you're learning the rules of jujitsu and all this stuff. But sometimes you just get gotta get out get out of your own way and just do jujitsu and just see what happens and play, right? Like when you guys think about um babies, right? Like think about babies when, I mean, it's, it's really fascinating when you think about babies, babies are experiencing this world for the first time and everything is so new and exciting. I mean, just walking outside would be like this, whoa, this experience. So when you think about them, how do they learn? They typically learn by like messing around with stuff. Like they, yeah. they play around with things right. and they, they, you know, the way that they speak, what do they do? They make noises and eventually they turn that noise into a mimicking way of making language. And so they play, they don't sit in a room where the people are saying, do this, do this, do this, right? It's not a classroom or something like that. Um, granted, that's the way that we do it now, but it works. But when it comes time to rolling, one of the ways that you guys should approach it, if you're trying to be, if you're trying to learn techniques is be willing to play. Right? There's a time when you got to sharpen your sword when you're getting ready for competitions. But when you're not ready for a competition and you're really trying to learn new stuff, you've got to be willing to play. You've got to be willing to like mess up. You've got to be willing to do dumb stuff and just have fun with that because that's where you start to learn things and it'll be this intuitive learning of your body. Remember, there's there's an intelligence of your body. They find there's neurons in your stomach and your heart as well as your brain, right? But they're all over the place, and your body and your mind are connected. And so sometimes you're going, to, your body's going to start doing things well before your mind figures out what the hell's going on, right? And so sometimes you just got to be willing to play and see what happens. 
I think um, so. One thing, flow rolling is great. It's a great way to discover or transition to new techniques and discover new techniques and stuff. So, but, should we do you think it's a serious question? Because it could be, I guess. Uh, <laughs> should we address that? Well, I mean, I'll address it. What do you do when you get a boner when you're drilling with a girl? Um, I don't know. That's serious. May not be serious. I mean, but I mean, I'm sure someone. I mean, I've seen people have it before. Um, I've seen guys like I remember my very first experience with a wrestling tournament. I remember seeing a guy get a boner from a wrestling match with another guy. Oh, okay. Sometimes it has nothing to do with like the actual <laughs> sexual nature of it. Um, but if you're if you're getting a boner with a girl, then you're not focused on what you're actually supposed to be doing. I've been training. I've never gotten a boner with a girl, and I've rolled yeah. with some beautiful women. Um, it, it just it's not a sexual thing. Like yeah, I, exactly. I, I'm, I'm training. I'm yeah. I'm rolling. Um, you know, and if you, if you can't handle it and you get a boner with a girl, then you probably shouldn't train with them. Well, your mindset's just off. You're, I mean, you're not focusing on yeah. jujitsu. So, I mean, just saying, so, so if it is what it is, then just, you know, kind of get away from it. So C flat. Thank you. Master the instrument, master the music, and then forget all that bullshit and fucking play. There you go. That's, that's the quote right there. That's I love it. that quote. Again, I have these quotes. Um, if you guys ever, I'll probably do a video someday. Um, I'm working on one now where I'm going to take you guys through like a day in the life kind of thing and kind of walk you through my daily routine. But uh, on my wall by my, my writing desk, I have all these quotes put up on a pin board and you know, they're always there. And so I see them all the time. So I don't, I, I don't have them memorized because I kind of look up and see them. So, um, I saw something about, and I'm sure this is, you know, the answer, or, you, or it's an obvious answer. It's if um, 10th Planet is better than traditional jujitsu. No. I mean, well, better, better is a relative term. Right, better, exactly. better, They're different. Better. They're both effective. It's just jujitsu. It, I don't even, it's just jujitsu. It's, right. it's a style of jujitsu. Right, right, That's right. all it is. It's a style. Just like somebody plays bottom. Right yeah, it's top, a, yeah. Um, here's one. A guy says, this is gears and games. He says, I have problems going from drilling a technique to implementing it. Drilling, mm -hmm. I nail it. While rolling, I find all the techniques are nearly useless or can't sink them in. So that's where situational rolling comes in. So I talk about this in my ebook that I have on my website. If you want to get that, uh, gears and games, if you look in the description box, there's some links there. It's the Focus Jiu-Jitsu book. Um, and so when you are drilling a technique and then when you want to use it in live situations, there's a, a, there's a gap that exists. And so to close that gap off, in, in the way that I, a lot of times I sort of liken this to, I liken it to lifting weights. So if I wanted to, to chest press 300 pounds, but I can only chest press 100 pounds, then what am I going to do? I'm going to work my way up incrementally by increasing the stress over time. So when you learn a technique and then you try to use it in a roll, a lot of times there's this big gap that exists. And what it is is that you have to start putting that move under a little bit of stress. And you can do this by in increasing the speed at, what you're, it's at which you're drilling the technique because if you start to go faster, your body's having to be able to sort of use the neuro, um, the neuromuscular movement patterns that it's developed in, in a faster speed, which stresses the body out. Mm -hmm. And then you can also do... Um, situational rolling. So let's say, for instance, if you were working a brand new guard sweep, well, then instead of just doing a full roll where maybe you get a chance to use that guard sweep one time and then the person passes and smashes your face, then basically do a round of pass and uh, defend, right? So basically on the top, the person will try to pass your guard. And on the bottom, you'll try to use your sweep or submission that you're working on from full guard. If they pass or you submit or sweep them, restart and do that over and over again because then you're getting more t quality time in that position to play around with it. Now, if you don't have a chance to you know, do can control that in your training, you don't have open mats or whatever, then when you're rolling with people that you know you can beat, then that's the time to play around with your new weapons, right? Like play around with the new stuff that you're working mm -hmm. on. So this way you have a chance to use it against someone that's not quite as skilled as you, and that'll be helpful. Um, C flat, I don't have a hard copy book out yet. I'm working on something now. I'm still kind of figuring out where I want to go with it. Um, and I'll, um, I'll probably do a, a sort of a, of a small batch release to my email list uh, first to kind of see how it goes. But we'll, I'll have a hard copy book, something or other, probably sometime out this this year. You made fun of DVDs, but you're going to allow books. I love books. Yeah, books are fun. I read books. Something about holding a book. Is there, nice. Well, I mean, but a book, that that's something. I have books. I don't have a DVD player. Yeah. I mean, I, I granted, I don't, <laughs> I don't have a TV at home. So it is what it is. I don't, I don't, I don't have a TV, don't want one. But... Um, 
but books, I use books. Right, right. right? And, and I mean, even with a, uh, an e-reader, I still will prefer a book any day over an e-reader. I still like them. They're mm-hmm. cool because sometimes I, you know, it's easier. Like when I'm on vacation, I can just take my iPad right. and use the Kindle app. But at home, like at nighttime, I like to read. And uh, there's something about holding that paper and turning the page and feeling like the, the paper against your hand. Right. Like, I like that more than I I feel do. like I retain like information better from a book. I don't know why. Like better than an e-reader mm. or something like that. I Pro- don't know why. Probably the, because of the physical. Like the, tactile. Tactile. You're probably a huh. physical element because you're holding a book there. And um, I don't know. But uh, I, I like books. True. What about this looks like B. Heffy. Um, I need some advice. My friend is the most inconsistent training partner ever, Mm -hmm. um, but he's the only training partner I have. So how can I get him to train, whether it's rolling or self-defense? What do you mean he's the only training partner that you have? Do you not have anybody else in your gym that trains? Uh, Heffy, um, (laughs) let me me know. Let let me know if you have other people in your gym. I have another question from Chad McCarthy. He says, have you thought about doing a satellite gym in other areas other than Louisville? yeah, at some point, I guess I would like to do a um, affiliate with someone. But if I do an affiliate, like an affiliate gym, I want to do it a little bit differently because, again, I it's just like my seminars. Like when I do seminars, I want to have dinner and I want to like hang out with people. I want to get to know them. Yeah. With an affiliate, I would want to help them with their business because that's one of the things where, you know, people will get a, become an affiliate gym and they get to use someone's name. And that name typically in the beginning is worth nothing. Right. What I would rather do is help people build their gyms so this way they can run it. Because here's something I get all like every week I'll get a message from someone that's a part of a gym that just closed down. They're like, oh man, my gym just closed down. What do I do? And for you guys that have become very attached to your gyms, man, like you could you imagine losing that connection to those people? That would suck. And so it's it's a bad thing. And so I, I would want to help those people be able to provide a good experience and build a good business around their gym that not only helps keep the gym afloat and and takes care of the instructors so they can take care of their students, mm-hmm. but also make sure that they don't veer too far in the business direction. Because sometimes, you know, with jujitsu gyms, it's different. It's a community. It's a connection to people. It's not just, I'm not selling like paper towel holders, right? Like it's something more than that. And a lot of times, I, another thing that I get a lot of times is that they people feel like their instructors have basically gone to the dark side and the only thing that they are concerned about is how much money can they rake out of them right and so i think there's a nice way to find that middle ground by offering a really good product and taking care of them and uh, i think to me that you know there's a way to do that and so if i do take on some affiliates at some point i'll make sure that they also get into contact with like my marketing guys and stuff like that that can help them build their gyms and also like work with joe on on the processes that need to be in place for the gym on the back end to make sure that you're bringing people in and so you can you can run the gym like a business opposed to I got a gym, but then it closes down because we don't make any money. And now my students don't have a place to train and I can't enrich the lives of others because the only reason I've been able to do the things that I've done and help other people is because we have a gym. If the gym wouldn't have been in place, if I wouldn't have had guys like Joe, like helping run the business side of it, the back end stuff, all the processes, psh, this stuff wouldn't have been around, right? Like the, like the gym, we wouldn't have been able to impact people in a positive way. Right, right. I wouldn't have been able to meet you guys through the YouTube channel. It wouldn't have happened. So, so here's a, this is one for, I don't know. We're going to get a name one of these times. That's going to be like a fake name. That's going to be really funny. I, after I think we all read the, it. the names are, a lot of them um, are like off, right? This one is Count. In, Count Ingdi. In, in teeth. teeth. Count Ingdi. I don't have feet. Uh, do you think jujitsu is a good thing for me to try uh, if I can find someone who will train me? Man, I don't know if you're being serious. Count uh, that you don't have teeth. If you don't have dead teeth, you don't have feet. <laughs> Ain't got no feet, but if uh, if you are like for some reason, if you were born without feet, or if you were sure. an amputee or whatever, I mean, I met a guy this weekend who has one leg, um, and then I have a buddy that has one leg that trained, and there's guys like uh, the the guy Kyle something. Um, who literally has no no knees, no feet, no right. hands, and he's out there submitting guys like like crawling on them and submitting them and taking them down with his body. So the cool part about jujitsu is that it'll work for people. Yes. It, it, it has this way of basically working. So like guys like um, they're you know the beautiful example of like um, you know when someone gets injured. They end up having to favor certain parts of their body, and they end up going in different directions with their game, and their body adjusts to it. And so if you come in with some different hindrances, right, your body can then do something with those. So what a lot of times in the beginning will be a hindrance, it'll be a like a, a problem. It'll be something that's an actual problem for you. Probably long term, if you keep training, you'll find a way to, to turn that into something special and turn it into a beneficial sort of thing that you can use for your advantage. 
Right. So, yeah, I think it's unique for you starting jiu-jitsu, but it's also unique for others that aren't used to training with someone that may not have, you know, feet, things like that. Yeah. So, so. in, in, in uh, C flat said, dude, look at the counts, other posts, he's fake news. He may be fake, but again, the content, let's say if you're an amputee, if you have some hindrances, doesn't matter. That's still going to be good information. So sure. I mean, yeah, just in general, um, Chiu, you addressed this in a video before, and it's something that hits home for me as well. William Vaccarano says, uh, I'll have limited time to train this year due to school schedules. I might be able to do it two, three times a week at most. I still want to compete around uh, September. What's your advice? I think two or three times a week is actually a good do number it, for man. a lot of people. Bro, do it. I, I, back in the day, that's all I could train was two to three times a week. See, yes. there's, there, there's a misconception that you have to train like five days a week to train to be good, right? Like, for instance, when I was, I mean, again, it is what it is. My body, for instance, is it's a little bit older, and I... I've come, as I get older, right, I'll just say it like this. I know that I'm never going to be a adult black belt world champion, okay? I don't, and I don't feel bad about that. I don't care. So when I train, I'm training for, like, longevity. I want to push myself really hard, but I also want to be able to do this for a long period of time. And so what I do is, is I'll push myself, but I also take days off. I take, I'll take days off throughout the week. And, like, when I won the Nogi Pans, when I won the... Uh, or when I took third in the Abu Dhabi trials this year, when I uh, won the Nogi Pans in 2016, when I, you know, I did all these things, I wasn't training like every single day, even though I could. I would train some days, I might train twice a day. Some days I might, or some weeks, I would take two days off back to back and let my body recover. And so mm -hmm. you can be good. It's about the time, the quality of the time, not just the quantity. Like when you go to the gym, are you pushing yourself? Are you really like putting all your energy into those roles? Are you like walking off the mat like, could you give him more? Could you have been more focused on those techniques when your coach was showing them? When you're drilling the technique where you kind of talking and goofing off rather than actually drilling those techniques? Because those things come into play. And I've had plenty of guys come into the gym who could only train two, three times a week, and they excel really well because when they come in, because of life, they can't come in any, anymore. And when they come in, they make the most of it. They train their butts off and they stay focused. Mm -hmm. So I think if you really make use of the time, you'll be fine and you'll be able to compete. And again, no matter what situation you're in, if you're competing, you're going to look for reasons out of it because it's going to be kind of freak you out. It might be nerve wracking and your body's going to be like, well, man, you, you I mean, I, hell, I remember one of my, my last fight, I was questioning myself whether or not I was training enough. I was training four, day, four hours a day sometimes. Wow. And so there was no way I could have trained anymore. I was just so tired. But in my head, I was like, well, you know, this fight's coming up. I wonder if I've trained enough. So understand your body's always going to do that. That's just your body kind of going through the uh, the rigor, the, the sort of the the stress response. Let that go. Just do it. Just get out there and do the damn thing. Yeah, and and the other thing is do things outside of jujitsu. Study tape, videos, whatever. Uh, do accessory training, mobility work. You know, and rest. Yeah, rest. And when it's time to rest, rest yeah. hard. Yeah, for like, sure. Like you don't ha like the, when it's time to sleep, when it's time to lay down, when it's time to relax. Let your body relax. Right on. Um, let's see here. What we got here? First tournament advice. Well, here, I want to do this one. We got one from old, uh, I just want to say this real quick. We got one. Um, this one's from David Drag Dragovas. He says, I like Eugene's shoulder care PDF. Thank you. Is something similar for knees? I joined a gym uh, that does leg locks recently. Tap early, still hope. Okay. So, uh, yeah, if you guys like have any like banged up shoulders, uh, Eugene has a... Um, a really good PDF that um, I, I helped you kind of like do the film, yeah. the, the pictures for or yeah. whatever. But he's got a PDF that, that has a bunch of like good stuff that you can do for your shoulders to kind of keep the health up because he's, yeah. a, he's a physical therapist. It's uh, it's on my website, uh, jujitsutherapist.com. Uh, it's a free uh, ebook for shoulder health. It basically gives you a couple basic range of motion exercises and some important uh, strengthening exercises just to work on areas that kind of get neglected with our jiu-jitsu posture um we always get like chew and i always talk about you know you getting that rounded posture so you're working on addressing muscles that can be tight and then strengthening muscles that can be kind of um you know this and put in a disadvantageous position by being rounded so thank you for that uh and chewy thank you for mentioning it thank you c flat for the uh the what do they call that super chat yeah thank awesome you. Thank you guys. Thank you for the uh, great. the contribution. Appreciate you, brother. What was the one that you had up there? Um, well, there's there's a couple quick ones, um, and you get this question a lot. It's from M. Abshir. It's about a uh, white belt doing a first tournament. Any advice? 
Um, one quick thing. Get a game plan in place. Hey, one hey, move hey. from every position. Boom. Uh, <laughs> here, here's one, and you, you, we've kind of gotten away from this a lot, yeah. uh, from Ishmael 8. He says, any solo drills to improve stand-up game uh, if we always start practice rolls from the knees? So we don't do that. It's not really, uh, you talk about not starting from the knees yeah, just because it's knees. not. It's not realistic. Yeah, yeah. So any uh, solo drills? Solo drills. Um, I have a I have a wrestling for jujitsu. It's my takedowns, the ones that I show in the classes. A lot of times, um, there's a section of solo drills in there, uh, like penetration steps, sprawls, things like that. Um, you know, those are the ones that I would recommend to start off with. Um, but again, if you need to get some, you can look up just basic wrestling drills uh, online on YouTube, and you could check those out. If you don't want to uh, pay for anything, you could go on YouTube and look up basic wrestling drills, like solo drills, and you'll find mm-hmm. some. This is uh this guy's got a great name. Bear that wrestles Khabib. Do you think wrestling is more effective than jujitsu and MMA? Um, mm. Have you seen that quote by Ben Askren? Yeah, what did he say? So he said that uh, just putting this out there, seven out of eight um, male champions in the UFC have a wrestling background. Mm-hmm. And then he said Crone uh, had that fight over the weekend. He's like, one guy submits uh, a low level jujitsu guy, and then everybody freaks out. So um, this well, question, yeah. Well, I think that, but we also have to think about like the time frame because see, the thing is, is people like to make these hard rules, right? But remember that ju- fighting fluctuates a bit, sure, right? Yeah. Because I mean, one thing is that as people fight more and more, like for instance, like George St. Pierre had great wrestling. He didn't come from a wrestling background, right? Right, But he had great wrestling um, and out wrestled a lot of good wrestlers. So I think that, you know, and, and there's been times where like guys like Anderson Silva, he was champion for a long ass time. Um, you know, there's guys that came into it and sure wrestling is a great base in, in wrestling, the work ethic that goes into it. But if you look across the board, a lot of times you'll see these, these sort of like fluctuations where you'll see like uh jujitsu guys. And then, I mean, what is it like, uh, who was the lightweight that uh, Jose Aldo was in there for a while? Yeah. He doesn't come from a wrestling background. So, uh, you know, it, it, right now we're, we're, it's dominated by wrestlers for sure, but give it time and it kind of, it'll go another direction. I've seen this happen in in MMA since back in the day. You had this initial uh, burst on the scene with jiu-jitsu. Then the wrestlers came in, and then the strikers learned how to like use the guard, and they'd get back up to their feet, and they'd kick the wrestler in the face. And then it just kind of fluctuates through. And so you see these periods where you'll see more jiu-jitsu or more wrestling or more striking being used. And it's like the, you know everybody kind of catches up to it, and then it, it changes, just like in jiu-jitsu competitions, right? Because there will be times where everybody's doing leg locks, and it's like catching everybody off guard. And then all of a sudden, everybody's doing leg locks, then it moves to something else. Right. Back in 2000, like... 9 2010 deep half guard was like all the new rage and then it went from deep half guard to uh um there was like what was the one position the 50 50 was big Mm -hmm. and then it went to baron bolo and then i mean just it's all over the place and so it fluctuates but it all kind of come back around so i wouldn't say it's better i think that it all that always depends on the person but i think wrestling's an excellent base um, just because of the power, the intensity. And when you're talking about a fight situation being able to put someone on their back to where you can punch them is always a benefit yeah um, got a couple more. Let's do a couple more, Chew. All right, let's do a couple more. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Joseph Shaw, your grip fighting stuff helped my game. I'm, I appreciate that, brother. I'm glad it, glad the grip fighting series, the Get a Grip grip fighting series helped you. Guys, That that is one of the most, I don't know Chewy says it, but whenever Chewy and I roll, like, when he gets the grips, it's it's over. Like it, he does what he wants to do. If we're doing gi, even no gi, and he gets the grip. So the gripping, grip fighting is like, I think one of the most overlooked aspects of, of jujitsu. But it's so important. It's, it's what's the first thing you do? You get grips. The first thing you do is get grips. So if I don't have the grips I want, I'm fucked. But it's just like you. I mean, for instance, like you know, Eugene. You guys may not know this. Eugene has a really good loop choke. Um, you know, I remember he, you know, he caught me a couple times back when he was a purple belt and, uh, you know, I, I learned from him. I remember like, like I was telling someone else, I, I showed someone else how to do a loop choke and they're like, thanks for the help with that loop choke. I'm like, thank you, Eugene. Cause that's where I learned it from or that's where I got the details from it. But when he would go to competitions, if, you know, he's, when he's in competition mode, if, if someone lets them get him, get the cross collar grip, they might get choked out. Like there was one tournament we went to, was it Charlotte? You hit four of those, uh, five. Four, four. It was four, four, four chokes, and it wasn't like the guy that just that just got submitted. His opponents would see it, and then they would still allow the grip to happen, and boom, he you know yank him up, put him in a choke. So you know, just like that, if if you get really good with the technique, if you watch black belts, 
as soon as they get the grip that they're looking for, boom, it's done. Right, it's like they, they get the move that they're looking for, so they're always working for the grips. And once they get the grips that they want, that's it. And so I think uh, I always I always preach it in my gym, and I preach it online. Grip fighting is imperative because if you fight grips, if you control the grips, you control everything. So, mm -hmm. all right. So, Mister the Go Hard. <laughs> all right. Uh, one, I'm on the lighter, uh, weaker guys at the gym. It makes uh, setting up techniques and mount escapes a lot more difficult. What do you recommend? Absolutely, it's going to make it more difficult. And I would say put yourself there more often. It's the difficult stuff that's going to make you better, right? If you if it was easy, like my wrestling coach used to say, if it was easy, everybody would do it, right? But it's not easy. And so that's going to be the, the, the good part. So if you continue to do it more and more, eventually you get better at, at getting out of those positions. So it's not always – it's not the advice people want to hear, but I would say just put yourself in that position more so that this way you can – eventually get out of it because again if you just trust in yourself over time your body will develop the muscular uh the whatever muscles are needed to do it mm -hmm. the strength used to do it your body will develop the timing and everything else and you'll be able to work your way out of there um but you got to give it a chance to do it and a lot of times you know it's just not a comfortable position so people try to avoid it as much as possible i'm telling you to put yourself there more often and keep working your techniques and the other thing if i can add you can if um you're a lighter guy move more a lot of times you'll hit the techniques on transitions because you're faster and you're kind of a step ahead so you may know all right i'm gonna get in mount this guy maybe i'll get just know that you're gonna go to something else be prepared to transition and keep going to the next thing because a lot of times you know even with guys that are good at jujitsu in general they're gonna be you have to set them up with like transitions you have to bait them for things so mm -hmm. it might be you're getting them out just to get them to escape so you can bait them for something else so just move because, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not one of the heavier guys. I'm not one of the lightest guys. But yeah, so when right I'm going middle. against big dudes, I have to, like, move a lot more. And then when you get a big guy that moves a lot, then you're really screwed. <laughs> That's a tough way to go. Like Muhammad or you. God, Muhammad's so fast. Yeah. 230 is like, not supposed to move like that. He's like a like cat. That. Yeah, 230 is not supposed to move like that. That's crazy. All right, let's get one, one or two more. One or two more questions, depending on how long I talk about everything. Um, let's see. We have 111 people on right now. It's yeah. Awesome. Um, I'm just going to share this real quick. Joseph Shaw, he says, my hips are terrible. Any advice? My left hip is terrible. Lots of pain. Hip flexors are tight. Stretch, bro. Like I'm telling you right now, like um, I've I've had a little I have a little knee injury. It's it's healed up already, but I, I gave myself a mandatory two weeks off of like hard training. So I've been doing like some exercise and things like that. Um, I've been stretching my hips out every single night, right? Because I, I know that my hips are probably one of my my problem areas. And uh, you know you don't have it doesn't have to be anything crazy. If you just want to start with something, go on YouTube, dude. There's literally information everywhere. Go put on YouTube and say yoga for hips. I guarantee you'll find something useful. You know, give yourself some sacred space in your home where you can sit down and just stretch and just breathe and just do it like every single day. And you'd be amazed. Just like, you know, if you want to get better at something, you do it as much as possible. Well, mm -hmm. if you want your hips to be looser and then they are, do some stretching every single day. You know, and again, we probably, we probably, and you might say, man, I don't have time. Go in your phone usage and look up how much time you spend on yeah. like social media. I guarantee you got it like at least 30, 45 minutes in a day that you can spend treating your body to some some stretches every day. It's not the easiest thing in the world because it requires discipline, but it'll be something that be well worth the um, the time spent. Consistency, yeah, you're definitely right. And there's different you, well, techniques. Shit, you know this, you're a physical therapist. Sure. So you understand like consistency. Right. You have to be, you have to be kind of diligent. You have to be consistent. Um and then learn about the type of stretching that your body responds well to mm -hmm. and uh, the type of techniques because somebody may do a technique or a stretch and you're like, this is not comfortable. I can't get in that position. Yeah. So look at modifications, find something that's comfortable and, and work with it and, and you'll get progress as long as you're consistent. Stretching, people hate on stretching and things like that. So people say, oh, it has no indication in injury prevention. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's really important. I think it's it's an important component of injury prevention. I'll say it like it's this. Huge. My knees, because of like years of like, I've had surgery on both of them and I've had some beat up knees just from years of training and stuff like that. When I stretch, my knees don't hurt. When I don't stretch, my knees hurt. 
I mean, for me, it's as simple as that. It's just like yeah. when I exercise because I don't, I don't, I feel funky. I exercise, I feel better. When I stretch, my my body feels better. And again, if you want to be flexible and you want to have more movement in your body, I mean, look at the people that can move the best. Like if I wanted to be the biggest, strongest person that I could possibly be, I would go look at like power lifters and strongmen. Yeah. Right. I would do what they do. If I wanted to be a more flexible person. I'll look at what guys, people like yogis and like gymnasts do because they have amazing movement in their body. So I'll, I'll say, let me, I don't have to take all of it, but let me get a little like sliver of what you got going on. So that's a combination. It's a blend rest, you know, stretching, diet. Yeah. I mean, you know, even, strengthening. It's, you know, it's, it's the, a mix. The, the inflammation part of it's huge too because I noticed like back when um, I, I did a video on this when I was talking about how the fact that I couldn't sit back on my heels. Right. So if my knees were on the ground, I couldn't sit my butt back to my heels for a long time. I couldn't do it. Even when I was a kid, I couldn't do it. And I remember it only started getting better when I cut out certain things out of my diet, like <laughs> dairy and wheat. Hmm. When I cut those out of my diet, magically it started to loosen up and my knees got a lot better. Um, you know, a lot of inflammation I think was probably a big problem. Yeah, for sure. So we do one more question, All guys. Right. Make it a good one. One Shuri. more question. You pick it. My, oh, I'm going to pick it. All right, I'm going to pick the last question. So if we got a good one, let's take a look here. Mm -hmm. In a world where Chewy picks a question, which one will he pick? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't. Did you guys know that I do really bad impressions? You you make pretty weird voices. I do really weird voices. Um, like, like I, I've always done that as a kid. I used to do stupid voices all the time. Who's uh, uh, who's one you still like to do? Um, I don't know. Want to hear a voice? E Ken F says, "Will you do the live chat again? We will. We do live chats uh, somewhat regularly, like at least once or maybe twice a month. Sometimes. What the podcast ones? Yeah, well, yeah, these. Well, these. Yeah. Yeah, we usually start them off a little chewy, chewy rant or chewy ramble, and then. Uh, get into it but then i asked you a question and then he like rambles for another 20 minutes yeah this is how it works this I is know, I, like i try to follow up to get a little more clarification or a little more insight and on go. something and he's just like Phew. yeah like well even like even at home like jess jess uh, she doesn't like to ask me questions all the time we're gonna she, start setting a timer <laughs> when it goes off we need like you know those like those little like clocks they have when they like chess matches yeah like set the <laughs> clock like all right man you got this much time go ahead it's all right people like to listen to you talk though Poor people. Yeah. <laughs> people show up. Um, you pick one. I can't find a good man. Man, Chewy, just... come on, man. Whoa. T Thunder Turtle Whoa. is asking for Christopher Walken. Can you speak into the microphone? What were you saying? Um, my, my, my Christopher Walken becomes yeah, like do a it. Joey Lawrence. Do that one. I don't, I don't like to do it on command. Oh, my God. It has to just break out spontaneously. <laughs> uh Man, there was one. We got one more good one, guys. Send it in. You find the good one, and I'll, I'll just answer this ah. one real quick. Um, Matt Reynolds, he says, I've been training for a year now. In a world. Okay, I've been, I've been training for a year now. Where did he go? And one stripe, one stripe white belt. I might, it might be because I have such bad cardio still. Should I care about rank? No, I don't think you should care about rank. Just... Just train, man. Again, you know, let us let me ask you guys a, a question here, okay, since you're on with this. Let me ask you a question. So let's say that you train, okay? I want you to think about all, like, besides rank, I want you to think about all the things that you like about training. I want you to think about the community that you're around. I want you to think about the people. I want you to think about the fact that you're in there and you're having a good time. You're exercising. You're maybe getting in better shape. Whatever benefits you've been given from jiu-jitsu, think about those things. Now, let's say that you were training in your gym, and for some reason, you will never, ever be promoted. You will always be the same rank. Your skill will get better. You'll be able to submit people. You'll be able to do all these things, but you'll never be promoted. Would you keep training? Hell yeah. I'd keep training. No I pressure. Kept, I, I would have kept training back in the day. Like I remember like when I first started, I never we didn't do stripes, so it wasn't a thing, but I remember never really caring about rank because... I just, you know, it was just something that really wasn't on the table. I never really cared that much about it. I was just happy to be there. And because I was a weird, awkward kid growing up, and I found this place where, like, again, we we, we could, a lot of times in jiu-jitsu, there is a, an element where, um, for instance, here's a great example. I consider jiu-jitsu sacred space. 
because so for instance there's a a book that i was reading it was talking about this and i was like man this this is amazing so when you think about what sacred space is sacred space could be a lot of different things but what the way that it works is you step in from that from the regular world right the profane world and you move into the sacred space and within that sacred space you become someone different and then eventually you come back out of the sacred space and you move back into the regular world right this is part of the hero's journey that you hear from joseph campbell um and you can think about tons of experience in your life that have been like this where maybe you went and did something and it was a life-changing experience right the space doesn't have to be physical right it could be something else like someone died or maybe you met uh, met your wife or something and your life completely was changed but then you eventually go back to the regular world with this new newly this new loss or this new gain or this new perspective and jiu-jitsu a lot of times is like kind of a daily dose of that because you walk into the gym you step on the mats and you're in this this place there's rituals that are there when you're on the mats you don't look at your training partners and think ah oh, that you know you're not measuring each other by the things that we measure each other by like on day-to-day -day basis right like you don't care about their car you don't care about what they do for work you don't care about their size of their house or how much they got their bank account you don't give two shits about it all you care about is hey jim bob sally whatever your name is are you ready to train like you want to be my partner you want to go all you're worried about is that you're there to train and then when you leave the gym you have these experiences and you're someone different when you go back to the regular world I and mean, we can always think about like how much confidence that people have been given or how they feel better in their own skin or the fact that they like there's guys that are taking antidepressants or dealing with ptsd and they come and train and then this the experiences that they have within the gym change them and make them able to deal with life a little bit better you can even think about if you've ever been to like a concert where like you're in a big field you go into this big field in this concert and when you're there you're not worried about what the person does for work you're not worried about what their socioeconomic level you don't care about any of that you're all wearing t-shirts and jeans or whatever and you're there experiencing this thing together right mm -hmm. and then when the the person plays the music people's bodies move a certain way they start to you know they put up lighters or now it's phones right they put up the phone light no the, the person never asked them to do that they just do it right and it's this experience that people are having and those experiences has happened in multiple different places in our life but understand that when you're going into the gym, there's so much more than rank. Now, rank itself is can be meaningful because, again, it's a representation of what you've put into it. Um, I don't like when people say all it is is to hold up your belt because if that was it, you wouldn't respect your coach and their black belt rank as much, but you do respect it. Mm -hmm. And you know that it means something because you know what they put into it. I think when people say that, oh, it's just to hold up your pants, that's bullshit. Because if not, why does it mean so much to all of us? Why do you see men that are tough, strong men cry? when they get their belt not not of sadness but of joy they're so happy or they it means so much to them to be recognized for this why do they do that mm -hmm. because of the representation of what it means again humans use symbols to represent things right like we use we use money green dollars to represent energy that can be used to buy things it's a piece of paper that's green it doesn't it, it's not worth shit unless we think it is right we use sounds to represent things right like my name is chewy that's a sound that we make but I'm not, those are just, that's a sound, right? Like, I'm, I'm not a sound, I'm a, I'm, I'm a being, right? But we use a sound. And so the belt that we wear is a representation of the time that we've put in, the skills that we've acquired, all the years that we've went through something, the, the injuries that we've fought through, the frustration that we've had, the competitions that we've had, all these things wrapped into one sort of symbolic thing that is wrapped around your waist. And so again, there's so much more going on to jiu-jitsu than simply belts, rank, and training. But... That's the rant. So, I think you should keep that. I think you should end on that one. We'll we'll end on that one because that was a good one. I mean that that's powerful. It, it, it is like when Adam got his black belt, you mm -hmm. know, or Chad got his black belt. You know, that was powerful to be there. Those were powerful moments mm -hmm. um, for them and for us that were there to witness that. Right? Because you knew how hard they worked. It was just a validation, kind of. It was just it, it was just a, a symbol of of what they put in the blood, sweat, tears, and hours and you know it's meaningful because uh, you know I, I don't i don't know like some people i maybe the question is if people get into jujitsu for a belt mm -hmm. versus what the belt means when they get it i right. guess like i never got into jujitsu for the belts like it was nice it was nice like hey i got a blue belt or i got with this belt it was nice to like know that you know what we see you you're doing your thing you're getting better 
here's a symbol to recognize that. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't like, I'm doing jiu-jitsu to get this belt so I can tell people I'm this belt, you know? Yeah, if you if you get into jiu-jitsu for a belt, you're not going to last. Right. Um, you'll yeah. get a blue belt and you'll quit. Yeah, I mean, in, if you get to a blue belt, because yeah. that's a that's a one and a half to maybe two year road, that's hard yeah. to do. But that's maybe why you see a lot of these blue belts quit. Is that because they they set that goal? Their goal for them was to get that blue belt, right? <laughs> they, well, they well they they set their goal on a blue belt, and then they get the blue belt, and they were expecting something different, and then it's like, you know, it's like people with money, for instance, right? Like people sometimes think that if they only had more money that they'd be happier granted there's a certain point where it, it gets rid of stress right like sure. you, you don't you don't have to worry about your bills but man like you you get you you know there's people that climb these ladders to to make more money right and then they get there and they make more money and the only problem is they realize they climbed up the wrong damn wall yeah. right and then they're like fuck I, i'm not any happier than i was when i was like stressed out about bills like i thought if i had more money it would you know whatever it's it always had the, you know you can't piece together fragments of your inner self with external things right your your inner happiness cannot be glued together with external things whether that be belts or promotions or tvs or cars or houses that shit has to be you have, that's inner work and the the external things are great but again to me jujitsu is just simply a form of and again it's it's sounds weird and maybe woo woo but it's simply a way to develop yourself both physically, but also internally and in the way that you approach things. Um, and so I think that, you know, if you're looking for a belt rather than what it can benefit you personally, right? Like think about the personal benefits rather than the external things. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Chewy, just before we wrap up, anything you got, uh, you got the seminar coming up? Yeah. Share that. And so then... a couple things coming up in April. I've got two seminars coming up. I have one, uh, April 5th and 6th down in Gracie Bradenton, which is south of Tampa. Um, you guys can check my Instagram and stuff. It's it's posted up there. Um, we're doing some cool stuff there, doing a, uh, you know, you all, you, you can get a recording of it uh, sent to you, and you can mm -hmm. also um, go to dinner with us. And then I'm also going to be a part of a uh, the BJJ Midwest um jiu-jitsu camp up in wisconsin if you guys want to join us there that's the following weekend and that'll be up in wisconsin my buddy wade runs it you'll be with me sean mark vives a guy named nick schrock from the hebrew association we call moose and he's incredibly tough um and we have a good time so we'll be there from friday to sunday in basically a secluded little camp out in wisconsin it's a really cool time um so if you can make it to that that's always a good one and um I think that's it, guys. That's it. We've got um, guys. If you want extras, um, extra conversations, content, Patreon dot com. Uh, the oh yeah, so for podcast, the, so. if you guys are interested, we do a Patreon for the podcast. You know, if you guys want to check it out, um, you can look up the details. Um, you know, just you can put in what is it? What's the address? It's uh, Patreon dot com forward slash the Jiu Jitsu podcast. The Jiu Jitsu podcast. So if you want to support, you can check that out. Yeah, as well. and you get a free T shirt. Limited yep. time, uh, but it's fun. We can do some extra stuff on there. So, guys, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I hope you guys got some some nuggets of information out of this. And yeah. again, thank you guys for your questions and your time. See you later.